Oi, meu nome é Cecília. Olá, sou Regina. Hi, my name is Nev Rafi. I'm currently studying early childhood studies at Guelph Amba. Eu sou do Brasil e eu sou uma estudante do curso de Broadcasting, Videography and Television. Sou mexicana, vivi na Ciudad de México. Sou estudante de produção de cine em Humber College. And I'm from the small island of Trinidad and Tobago. I'm from Brazil, Sao Paulo, more specifically, the biggest one. There's a lot. It can be great and can be terrifying and awful, <laughs> especially for, I guess, for women, it's very hard. There is a lot of sexism, so I can't simply, for example, go to a bar by myself, and uh, that's dangerous. And it's also, uh, I'm going to be judged as a sex professional if I just go to a bar by myself. And there's also lots of other things, um, harassing and all the time, wherever you go, if you just leave your place, you're going <laughs> to be harassed. That's, there's no freedom, yeah. I'm from Mexico City. Mexico in general is such a diverse country. The main difference is it's corruption <laughs> and um, how the society is really divided, economical like differences. There is a broad and really rough uh, definition of, of who is rich and who is poor. And it's so sad and something it's really hard to fight but we're getting there, I guess. There's not many opportunities back home. It's a different lifestyle, like money-wise, family-wise, economically-wise, it just, it's different. Being here, it's a larger country. I have more opportunities to go places and start fresh and get my name out there, whereas back home, lifestyles are different. I don't really know how to explain it very well, but there's not many opportunities. Well, Canada sound, sounded like the, safest option in terms of being alone as a woman in a foreign country. People here are very polite, I can say that, but they're not um, warm as in my country, so. Culturally, we're so different, like in terms of, of personality, and no, it's not a stereotype. The process was a little difficult because of just the culture changes that happened, but you can't really avoid those because you're going to a new country. Leaving behind the people I've known for a long time, like my friends that I grew up with since I was four, or leaving my parents that obviously raised me to be who I am, it was very difficult. But I had to for the sake of my future, but I'm not gonna leave them behind, I'm going back to them. But not having them all the time is a little hard. I'm alone here and I'm really close to my family. It's, it's really hard leaving my dogs, my, my brothers. Uh, one is younger than me, so when I go back to Mexico for vacations and stuff, it's like, oh, you're taller than me now. Okay, I see that. When did this happen? The, it's hard going away and knowing that your life is still going on and their life is still going on. I go crazy sometimes. I, I really do. It's just, it's ups and downs, and it, it's been a emotional roller coaster. We are not always um, fine, and I guess it's okay, so that's how I've been dealing with my ups and downs. When I'm sad, I just admit it. <laughs> I am sad, I am upset, I'm angry, I wish I had more friends. That's hard. I, I don't know how I cope, I just do. <laughs> Maybe just admitting. I try to talk to my mom and dad all the time, like on a daily, send them pictures of what's going on. My dad sucks at responding, so I just gotta send everything to my mom. Good day, bad days, I would say for sure. You definitely just have those slumps where you don't wanna leave your room, or you have zero motivation to do anything. But you also have those days where I'm absolutely bouncing off the walls for no reason at all. I would like, as soon as I make my name here, I wanna go back to Mexico and help my country and its film industry that it's kind of harsh. I see myself doing like working movies, what I see myself doing, whether it's writing in whatever, camera production, um, whatever it comes to, to me, I'll take it, I'll, I'll learn and I'll experience it and I'll improve it, yes. 
just do it. Like, there's no point in overthinking it or hesitating, because at the end of the day, you have to do something. And if you're gonna do something, you might as well do it the best as you can and take the risks, because it's gonna pay off. You're gonna have your hard moments. It's gonna be difficult, but at the end of the day, you're not gonna get left behind. You're not gonna suffer, you're not gonna fail. You're gonna be fine, but you have to also make the effort to be fine. They will miss the food, they will miss the weather, the family, the friends, the, the warmth, the heat from people. They're gonna miss time to have fun because uh, full-time studying here is just crazy, insane. Ooh, for that. Try and have fun. <laughs> Try and go out and meet people. Go just push yourself. Go, go get to know um, interesting places and uh, meet new people, have fun. It's part of the student life. It should be. It's an experience and, and uh, it's never gonna go back. That's just me speaking as a mature <laughs> a student and person, so. Try to be comfortable being alone. Even if you have people back in your country that are your support group, you have to be okay mentally, physically, um, socially to like overcome all of these um, like day-to-day -day activities and yeah, just try to be happy with yourself before taking this big, big step. A child who learns yoga has an experience of self-awareness and connecting to their mind at a very early age. So I think there's a significant difference between anyone that does yoga and that doesn't do yoga. The benefits of yoga for kids, I would say the main one is connecting to breath because kids that have that experience of calmly breathing and noticing their breath, that tells their brain that everything's okay. It helps them focus. Doing yoga helps your physical body, it helps your mental state, and the awareness of all of that is what can benefit a child the most. We like to kind of get energy out first, it sort of pulls it up in a child and then once they have something to work with then we can ask them to sit a little more still sometimes even just like asking them to freeze or listen to the sound of the chimes it gives their mind something to concentrate on yoga in schools actually there there are some teachers that put it into their classrooms there's teachers that offer it as a phys ed unit but there's very little room in the curriculum right now, so there needs to be space for yoga. We need to kind of normalize it also, that, and know that it's not just a cultural thing just because it was started in India at, at one point. We need to realize it's a human exercise, it's a human skill to do your yoga, to bring mindfulness into your everyday life. How do you feel after you do yoga? Um, I feel more calmer and a bit sleepy. <laughs> do you like the stretching? Yes. And do you do yoga like every day or every other day? Every other day. A little bit sticky. Good. Good. Does your brain feel smarter? Yeah. What's your favorite yoga pose? Dragonfly. Dragonfly. Oh, you like dragonfly too. I don't remember any other ones <laughs> because Dragonfly is my favorite one, so I don't remember any other ones.
Where's your mind? Well, some of the significant differences between children who practice yoga and children who don't, first and foremost, kids who practice yoga, they are much more balanced, I find. They're able to manage conflicts and their self-regulation and focus is much higher. A couple of years ago, I started taking yoga. I've been taking it at the Masonic Village and then uh, Briar does it twice a week at the Lamp. So some of the benefits for my teenagers who I teach yoga to is that they're able to really use the tools in their everyday life. For instance, I teach a teenage class, the Jean Augustine Center, and the girls are so grateful for the, the practices that they're learning in that class because it helps them with their exams. It helps them when they're feeling overwhelmed or stressed out. They share how they're using the deep breathing techniques or the body scans to help bring down their anxiety when they're feeling really overwhelmed. And so they're using the tools off the mat in their everyday life. And that is incredibly important, especially for teenage girls. So there are many benefits to starting yoga. First and foremost, self-regulation is huge. They're calmer, more mindful. Um, there's a lot more empathy they're able to kind of stay in the prefrontal cortex versus going to the amygdala, you know, uh, that fight or flight response. I like um, yoga. I like breathing to exercise. I like um, meeting to people. I like my teacher. I'm happy. Egg waffles! To put it simply, the exact origin of egg waffles isn't really clear because of how common of a food it is, but it had humble beginnings. They were born from trying times in 1950s Hong Kong when shopkeepers had to use the most out of their supplies. So they used unsold eggs, flour, sugar, evaporated milk, and made a batter, which was cooked into a waffle iron that was shaped like bubble wrap. Then during the 1970s, Hong Kong had another economic crisis and a surge of immigrants from mainland China came over. So many people became hawkers for a living and they turned to egg waffles because they were simple to make. And then it was everywhere on the streets. Even when hawkers slowly disappeared in the 90s because of government regulations, it was clear to Hong Kong that the endurance of the egg waffles was integral to the city's culture, cuisine, and history. History. Egg waffles, however, did not just remain in Hong Kong. The handover of Hong Kong from the British back to China brought over a large wave of immigrants to Canada, especially Toronto, during the 80s to 90s. Many of them opened traditional egg waffle shops in Chinese Canadian malls, especially the Tung Tung shop here in Pacific Mall. Hello guys, I'm at Pacific Mall and I'm going to go to Tung Tung to try the traditional Chinese egg waffle. Let's go. <laughs> Not bad. Although egg waffles weren't a new thing in Toronto, they remained generally known to only the Chinese Canadian community. Until the mid 2010s, when new shops popped up around the city and around the world, selling the modern version. Modern egg waffles may come in different flavors like chocolate or matcha, and it's folded into a cone with many fillings like ice cream, cookies, and much more. It's clear that the egg waffle has transformed into something more sweeter and a lot more attractive to the modern food lover, which is why it's so popular worldwide. So as of right now, I am at Golden Bubbles at Vaughn, and I'm here to try out their modern egg waffle with ice cream.
Looking at the modern version of egg waffles, one might think that it is significantly strayed from its origins. If that's the case, then it's become a regular Americanized food, relinquishing its Chinese identity. To address this issue, Alan Yao, CEO of Golden Bubbles, will tell us how his shop stays true to the origins of egg waffles. Hello, my name is Alan, last name is Yao, uh, Canadian, born in Hong Kong, uh, been here in Canada for almost 45 years. The waffles traditionally is eaten by itself, like a, like a cookie, essentially. A nice, hot, or even like an egg tart, put it that way. The culture is different. A lot of Asians like it though, but other local people, oh, that's too chewy. Oh, that's too hard. It's gonna cut my lip. So we have to make changes to it so we can understand. A lot of people in here, in Canada, don't like bare foods. A bread, I must put something on it. This, I must put some on it. This, I have to put something on it. They just don't like the original aspects of it. Once you take the waffle and add things to it, the waffle, ice cream. The problem is they don't sit properly. Why? Round, flat. What do you do? You fold it. There you go. Now when people look at a bubble waffle, they see the cone, <gasps> ice cream cone. You don't need to educate that them. Ice cream, no education. They go together, boom, magic happens. Well, there you have it, egg waffles. Sylvia Talat was barely 10 years old when she had to endure war and revolution in her own country. This is the story of a young woman who had to endure the loss of her freedoms and find a way to build a new life for herself in a different country. My name is Shima Majpur. I'm 27. I'm Sylvia's oldest daughter, and Rebecca is my younger sister. I always had a very close relationship with my mom, even as a very young kid. And I always looked up to her and respected her and looked for her, looked to her for the truth. And a lot of the unfortunate, difficult things that she went through as a young person in Iran made her an insanely incredible mom. She didn't pass down a lot of the lessons that were detrimental to her, to me and my sister. She wanted us to have a very different life and feel very different about ourselves. I was only nine to 10 years old, but what I remember, it was just entertainment in any form ended. It was nothing, really. Even the, the get-togethers were all political debates. Nothing on TV to watch. There was this nine o'clock curfew pretty scary um, just growing up very fast because there was not not much fun around school was the worst every school had this group of people like the morality team just in it just supervising students and staff so they were there they're watching every move and uh, you know people could lose their jobs so they were acting pro-government, promoting whatever they stand for. We are being searched by the front entrance every morning, body bags, everything. And God forbid if you have a hairbrush in your bag. That could change your life. Things got really difficult when I moved to my teenage years. That's when you become a whole person with feelings with wanting to have independence. You want to do things and so much limitation. And we couldn't do anything decent and normal, like just walking down the street, having your, our Walkmans on. Not that we didn't do it, we did do it, but with our heart pounding and, you know, watching over our shoulders. We formed this group of course, the parents had to connect and get to know each other and make sure it's safe. But then that, that was 
our escape from this whole thing. Just getting together inside the house, inside our bedrooms, basically, and just party, just wear 80s makeup, practice Michael Jackson's dance routines, things like that. Escape this whole outside world. Inside closed doors, we would talk about all our frustrations, forbidden dreams, walking with the boy we love on the street, holding hands. When my best friend told me that she's leaving the country, I was in this telephone booth. It was after ceasefire of war. I, I knew that moment that I can't, it's impossible for me to stay behind and survive this, this situation, this life, this environment. And that's when I started pressuring my parents that we need to leave. It's just the life that I've lived before. I can't believe after so many sacrifices, so many deaths at that time, and it's happening again. Yeah, I feel like every young child that I see pictures dying on the street, I feel like they're my children. It's very emotional. <sighs> but at the same time, I'm just so grateful that I'm, I have my kids here safe and I can only thank my parents for their courage to live when they did. I don't know how they did it. How did they know they can make a living outside their own homeland? I can't even believe I lived that life. It's such a distant past. Only certain scenes, certain movies, certain situation, it could make me, you know, feel it again and realize the whole journey made me who I am today. And, um, Are you happy with that person? I am. I am. Cut! <laughs> Cut! <laughs> In today's modern world, it is easy to rely on our mobile devices. But when does reliance become more than that? Are we on the verge of a new addiction? To help find an answer, we go to an expert on the subject. Over the last decade, and coinciding with the advent of the smartphone, cell phones are an increasingly ubiquitous part of our culture. And sometimes, a cell phone can be a really great tool in class. Sometimes, it's a total distraction. You know, when someone is using a cell phone in a movie theater, it's really annoying and kind of ruins the experience for others. And it can be the same in the classroom. As faculty, we sometimes feel like cell phone police. You know, I often get requests from industry looking to hire our graduates, and they almost always say, I'm looking for someone who's not on their phone all the time. So managing cell phone use is an employability skill now. We then went to the public to hear what they thought about how cell phones affected us. We started by asking how often they used their phones. Um six or seven hours. Four to five hours. Every day, every minute of every day. No matter what we asked, they all agreed on one thing. They use their phone. Oh God, uh, too much, like way too much. Uh, uh not too, too often probably. Next, we asked what they used their phone for the most. Generally, have social media. I'm just checking social media and talking with my girlfriend. 
probably work, and then after that, social media. of people say they have never gone longer than 24 hours without their cell phone. So we decided to ask if they could. I mean, if I was still able to use it for music, then yes. No, I have a terrible sense of direction. I think I could. Like, I think um, if it was like necessary, With mixed answers, we decided to ask a harder question. Could they go without their phone entirely? No. No. I could not. This, this one I don't really know. I don't know for my entire life. I don't think I could. Um, it, it's, it's just become so kind of ingrained in my mind now. Like, I don't, I don't know if you want to say brainwashed or whatever, but it's, it's yeah, like it's in my brain now. <laughs> With cell phone use skyrocketing and the damages social media can cause, we wanted to ask whether they thought cell phones were damaging to our society. I think more it's more problem about social media than phones themselves. Like communication is fine, but like social media kind of gets a little. Oh yeah, I think today I was on the bus and just like I saw three kids with a phone and they were like seven, so yeah. that's the problem. I do think it's a bit of a problem, yeah. I've noticed like sometimes when I go for dinner with friends and stuff, they're like sitting there on their phone and I'm like, come on, guys, like, put it down. We realize asking you to give up your phone is unrealistic. However, our hope is you think about your cell phone use and try to put down the gadget more often. It's, it's a problem. <laughs>...to adopt or shop, the age-old question that plagues man's best friend. In hopes of finding the answer, we traveled to St. Catharines to speak with a man well acquainted with pets. Hi, my name is Jeff Riley. I am the owner of Pet Value on Vansico Road in St. Catharines, as well as the one in Niagara Falls on Lundy's Lane in Kalar, and we also own the store in Dunville. My wife and I have been partnering in Pet Value since 2014, and has become a family business and a passion. Um, so I've had animals all my life. Starting from a young age, I had hamsters, fish, dogs, basically everything in my life except for cats. But I've been in retail all my life as well. So I wanted to change my retail career. And I've always in, been in automotive retail. And I was always looking for an opportunity to become into quote unquote happy retail, where people want to make purchases instead of making grudge purchases. So back in 2008, when I lost my job, I was looking for opportunities and I interviewed with PetSmart actually, out of all companies, to become a manager. And I realized that going through um, that part of retail, that everybody was always a happy visit and to come in to spend money on their, something they wanted to spend money on. And here we are almost nine years later with three stores under our belt. So how do your adoption events work? So we have a few different style of adoption wow. events. Number one, we always have kittens and cats in store adoptions at all times. So we do have permanent cages that are usually housed by cats or kittens, as long as the shelters have them. We also bring in small animals, bunnies and guinea pigs um, and birds if they actually have an overflow that they need to get rid of or they'll come on an ad hoc basis and just stay within the store. 
We also do weekend events or just day events where we'll invite different rescues to come in. They'll bring in a group of puppies. We'll set up a pen at the front of the store, but we're most uh, known for our large adoption events where we will actually set up a tent in the parking lot. And we've had as many as 110 dogs come up um, and spend a week with us. Um, we get volunteers from all over the city, from different areas, and they'll come in and they'll feed and water and walk the dogs. Um, we usually have some sort of event or party on a Saturday that goes with them where we'll do a fundraising barbecue, we'll have penny sales, raffles, uh, vendor show sales out in the parking lot, but it's usually a very big circus-like event um, in our parking lot. So hi, my name is Kelly. I'm uh, here at Pet Value Vansicle. I work with Jeff and I'm the manager of the store. Uh, I was told that you got this dog from uh, one of Jeff's adoption events. Um, how did the event help you find the proper event? Um, so our uh, boxer puppy had actually passed away the previous year and uh, we kind of said, no, 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 we're not ready. We're just going to give it some time because she had a hard time at the end. We, we knew that we wanted a dog. We knew that we wanted to adopt the next dog, uh, but we weren't sure if we were ready at that point and uh, ended up, I was here and I was helping the, with the event um, and just, you know, caring for them and walking them and exercising them and just fell back into that full love of, of having a dog around and, and just their energy. It's, um, it's always awesome. So we, we already knew from a boxer how much energy they were going to have. And there was a couple of large dogs that were at the event. And um, we had the opportunity to walk with them, to care for them, um, to clean their cages and that uh, whatnot. And we also uh, were able to see how they were reacting um, with other animals, different situations, with people. So we had the opportunity to really see how their behavior was um, before we actually um, decided on, on adopting the dogs. So do you find your adoption events to be successful? Very successful. Um, like I said, we've had events where we've adopted as many as 107 dogs in seven days. Um, our typical large adoption events, we see nothing less than 50 to 55 animals find new homes. When we do our weekend adoption events, we can see cats and kittens. Um, we've adopted as many as 17 cats in two days um, out of our event. Um, so it's very important to see these, these animals go to new homes and they're very successful, not just for the animals, but it's also good payback for our business as well. What do you think makes the event so successful? Honestly, the success in it is just seeing the people, the happy people, um, and finding an animal get a home. Like watching the people come in as a family where they bring their young kids in and to see the kids light up when they know they're getting a new kitten or a new cat or a new puppy. Um, it's always fun just to watch those. But anytime an animal finds a home and gets out of a shelter, that's a success. Hola, mi nombre es Luis Orlando Velázquez, alias El Chamo, multicampeón internacional de kickboxing, artes marciales, campeón mundial de fitness y de fisicoculturismo de la IFBB, máster, prendedor, creador del programa Fit Over 50, entrenador de defensa personal y entrenador de estrellas y otros atletas profesionales. A continuación, esta es mi historia. Parte de esta historia empieza con que en mi mejor momento de mi juventud, que me sentía que estaba en mi mejor momento, compitiendo, trabajando, entrenaba a las fuerzas especiales, a la policía, entrenaba a grupos de mujeres en defensa personal, tenía equipo de MMA, de Jiu Jitsu, campeón de Jiu Jitsu, campeón de kickboxing. Tuve en el 2007 un accidente automovilístico que casi me cuesta la vida y casi me cuesta caminar. Los doctores me dijeron, no puedes hacer más deporte, vas a poder competir más, no vas a poder hacer deporte en la intensidad que lo venías haciendo. Fue frustrante, fue un momento duro para mí porque desfallecí, me decepcioné a mí mismo, no quería seguir adelante. Gracias al apoyo de mis familiares y todos que me acompañaron en ese momento, fue duro. Tuve que luchar contra mí mismo y entendí que mi peor enemigo soy yo. Logrando ese entendimiento y ese sufrimiento, esa, esa, esa cadencia de fe en ese momento, de ahí nació. Por eso aprendí de que donde 
las cosas nacen de donde no hay nada, de donde hay un dolor es que nace un progreso, un cambio y un triunfo. Por eso ahorita actualmente, para nunca olvidar ese momento trágico y fatal que me tuvo en cama por mucho tiempo, siempre pongo a prueba mi físico, pongo a prueba mi, mi, mi fuerza de voluntad, puntos extremos de frío, de calor de ejercicio, trabajo 3, 4, 5 horas al día de entrenamiento y en lucha y, ese, y ese, ese, esa sensación me, ha, me lleva siempre a ese punto de dolor que tuve antes, a recordar de que eso es lo que hizo ese cambio en mí y logró lo que soy yo ahorita. Soy Luis's wife, me siento muy lucky to be able to say that, to be his partner by his side, to be his support team. He is the most giving, kind, generous person that I know. He builds people up all around him, our friends, our community. He always wants to know, what do other people want? How can I support you? The saying, you know, I would give you the shirt off my back, he embodies that, that's what he does. My entire family, when they first met him, of course, just absolutely fell in love with him. They often say he, he brought such incredible joy into our family. We were already a happy family, and he just added so much more. Que después de todo ese momento trágico, llegué y tuve logros que jamás en mi vida pensaría que tendría. Gané campeonatos internacionales, gané campeonato mundial de fitness, eh, multi internacional campeón de kickboxing y un coach exitoso actualmente y galardonado. Mi papá siempre ha sido mi modelo a seguir. Él siempre ha sido una persona muy alegre, siempre ha sido una persona que te enseña a no rendirte. Es una persona que entra a un cuarto y simplemente hace todo el mundo sentir bien. No, no deja que las adversidades a uno lo hagan sentir mal. Él siempre me ha enseñado a no rendirme, a nunca dejar atrás mi sueño, a siempre seguir adelante. Hubo este tiempo en que simplemente yo no me gustaba lo que hacía, pintar. Eso, pintar es mi pasión, simplemente no podía conseguir seguirlo, pero no, él me dijo, sigue, tú, tú puedes, tú tienes talento y aunque yo no quisiera, él sabía que simplemente era un mal momento, que simplemente era algo que en el momento obviamente no podía conseguir, porque más adelante todo iba a salir bien y así mismo fue. Gracias a ese trágico momento, a ese dolor, creo este éxito que tengo ahora. Y solo quiero compartirlo con ustedes y que entiendan de que las pequeñas cosas a veces que no vemos son las más importantes. Hay que seguir adelante con consistencia, con fuerza, voluntad y recordar que no hay nadie que te pare, solo tú mismo. Warhammer 40,000 is the most popular war game in the world. With an ever-growing community of passionate fans, Warhammer has become more popular than ever. My name's John, and um, for the last like 20 years, I've been playing Warhammer, I guess. And for maybe since the middle of the pandemic, when nobody could do anything, I started a YouTube channel, uh, just talking about the army that I play, which is Blood Angels, and at the moment, um, the channel's just passed like 12,000 subscribers. So it's kind of more than I had hoped for, honestly, but that's where we are just now. The local game store had, uh, had Warhammer, and it just looked like, well, it was just armored Marines with guns against orcs. And 
that's where it all started for me. So I honestly probably could have bought like any game when I was like 10, you know, I was a 10 year old in a hobby store with, with, with money and I could have just bought anything, but I guess Warhammer attracted me. My name is Michael and I am the owner and operator of Wandering Adventures, a tabletop gaming store. With Warhammer, the big interesting point is the lore. Uh, well, that's what first drew me in and that's what kind of keeps me going. It's a living game that they constantly update and once I found my way into it through a series of novels, it really kept me engaged. It is creative um, and it is also therapeutic. In, in some ways, it's like an escape from, from reality. I just find the painting side of it, like just the, the completion, probably like the completion side, like when I'm doing painting and stuff, I, I enjoy the time, but it's more about like the ultimate like, you know, finishing models and putting them on a shelf and feeling proud of stuff. With the hobby overall, there's just so many parts that you can engage in that makes it so, so unique. That creative side for more artsy people, that math side for more uh, like your people that like to see numbers and things that make sense. And then that lore side for people that are really into just fantasy universes. Warhammer is all about making friends and having fun, right? Like everything else is secondary to me now, I think. Uh, as much as like I want to go to tournaments and I want to win tournaments, etc., I just want to make friends and have fun and make sure that, you know, like I want it when I'm at an event, if someone plays against me, maybe somebody doesn't, you know, sometimes I go to an event, people know me from the channel, sometimes they don't know me at all, but I like it at the end of the game if they've just said like, you know, that was the most fun I've had all weekend at this game, a uh, really good opponent. That's what I'm aiming for, I think, now. When I had started the game, uh, it was like kind of embarrassing going into the store with my little box of uh, plastic men. And uh, it, it was, it, there were some experiences being at the store where you were a little embarrassed or shy. But I think now, um, with as widespread as superheroes and Dungeons and Dragons, and like some of the best television is as fantasy as it gets. And some of the most money is like spent in television is on Lord of the Rings, The Witcher, these kinds of properties that are just super steeped in the fantastical that I don't think it has that, that stigma anymore. I think people that come into the store are proud to be here. I hope now, I hope the world's getting to a place where everything is more inclusive and people wouldn't have a stigma. I think I think Warhammer is probably less stigmatized than Dungeons and Dragons. I and I I don't really know why in my mind. I just think that like Dungeons and Dragons are very old IP and people might think of it like as older. So Warhammer maybe has an advantage that way. I mean I never let it bother me. If I wanted to play Warhammer or if I wanted to play Dungeons and Dragons, I just did it. Yeah, I get a lot of joy seeing how much other people enjoy their little finer moments, I guess, in the hobby. I think it's gonna get bigger because they're gonna do some movies or some TV shows with uh, Henry Cavill obviously piloting it and like that's gonna be big just because it's Henry Cavill. And then of course there's the whole uh, like Amazon buying the IP for this game and taking it to film and television, with it, which I think is gonna be a unique time for this hobby. It's, Games Workshop is very protective about their IP and they're very selective of who they let touch it other than themselves. So this going to some, someone like Amazon who has like a lot of money, it's gonna be a very interesting time for the hobby. <laughs>
nervous, obviously, but this was fun. I'll, I don't know if I'll do this again, but <laughs> uh, it's a nice crowd over here, and everyone at the film cafe is great, and I'm thankful for the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the enjoyment of playing for people. Uh, you know, you play for hours and hours at home, and you want to share that with uh, others. Hi, my name is Jody. I am an open mic host, and I've played a lot of open mics. After I graduated, I was like, oh, what do I do for my life? And I actually remember the exact date, April 12th of 20, uh, 2012. I wrote up a list of goals to do as a musician, and uh, I made it a, like a promise, like I'm gonna go to as many open mics as I can, and people are gonna call me the troubadour. Like, I still go through a lot of challenges. The last show I did, five people showed up. For someone starting music, it's a great place to network. The venues that usually have open mic are open to having new artists, so if you impress people there, if you, you know, get a lot of people clapping, the owner might be like, hey, come play here on a weekend, come play here on this date. And, uh, yeah, you just get to network. It's a great opportunity for people to get used to playing in front of an audience and maybe play a show later on. Travis picking refers to, it, it certainly comes from that. Travis picking is a... My name is Randy Finney. I went to the music program at Humber College. I hosted open mics because many fingerstyle guitar players, which is a fairly lonely endeavor, it's a slow, solo guitar playing, really didn't have outlets for sharing their accomplishments and ha having other people celebrate their compliments, accomplishments. And uh, <clears throat> so that's why I started it. Reaching people was far and away the most difficult thing. Uh, it wasn't difficult to find places that were willing to have us come and play there, but it was difficult at first for the word to get out and to let us to let everybody know that we existed. It's a fun social event, so we I usually get to see a lot of different musicians and players come out. Since I've started, it's given me a lot of practice to get better at the guitar. Make sure that you keep the open mic about the people who show up, not about you as the host. Uh, Often on an open mic, I won't even play. If there's a lot of people, I don't play because the open mic isn't about me, it's about the people. The best open mics, like, they're very open, welcoming communities, and I try to do that when I'm hosting, like, make sure everyone's comfortable and make sure it's a good time for everyone and they're learning.